So a bunch of new stuff is either coming out or wrapping up this month, and although I don't watch everything, I want to share with you all my thoughts on a TV show that I really enjoy, and a new Marvel movie, again. That's right, I'm reviewing two things in this video. First, I'll talk about the new season of The Boys that just wrapped up, and then talk about the new Thor movie. If you're here for one and not the other, just click away or skip to whenever. But if you're new here, make sure you subscribe and hit that bell icon. And don't forget to like this video if you enjoyed it. Now, let's get into the review. Despite how negative my commentaries are on this channel, you may be shocked to learn that from time to time, I do actually find a TV show that I like to watch. I know, it's crazy, but I actually really like The Boys. The season finale dropped Friday, and I knew that I was going to want to talk about it. But since I have never even talked about the previous two seasons on this channel, I want to share with you all my thoughts on them, but also give a basic overview for those who have never seen it. Eventually, I'll touch into spoiler territory when talking about this new season, but if you haven't seen The Boys at all, I'm sure there's a good chance that someone you know has already told you that you should watch it. If you are feeling at all burned out from Marvel, I really think that this show is the antidote. At its core, The Boys is an action drama that involves a world where superheroes exist and are are real, but they're controlled on all fronts by a giant corporation named Vought, and all the superheroes are terrible people. The series is titled after the group of protagonists that you watch come together to fight against lies, manipulation, and conspiracies propped up by this mega corporation. While I do believe that this show is very good, I will say that it's definitely not for everyone. When it comes to the violence, gore, and adult content, it's like Deadpool on crack. I really can't think of a time when this show holds back from anything. It's pretty overwhelming most of the time. Anytime I feel uncomfortable, I just kind of laugh, but usually it's genuine, because the show is so over the top that it is played in a comedic way. But again, it's not for everyone. Mild spoiler, but one of the central female characters gets S8 in the first episode, and I know some people who couldn't get past that first part of the story. And hey, that's okay. But I still hold this series up with high praise from its first two seasons, and the third is no different. Season one does a great job at dropping you directly into the middle of this universe. Instead of the Avengers, it's the Seven, and instead of having mostly benevolent superheroes who fight for the good of of humanity, you have the world's biggest self-centered narcissists who only care about how the public perceives them. They star in their own movies and they fight crime on the streets. But only some of them. And those guys get contracted out to work with local law enforcement. Oh, and Vought is lobbying Congress to get superheroes placed into the military. The Boys is arguably the most realistic depiction of what superheroes existing would look like in our world. The superheroes are assholes. The Boys are assholes. Everyone has a story, even the ones that don't have any lines. There's at least someone you can sympathize with, empathize with, root for and cheer against. I thought season one was very enjoyable and season two only raised the stakes. This is the only show to consistently make my jaw drop if that says anything. This show is also a dark comedy and a political satire. Part of what makes it so realistic is that the absurd sh** the characters in this show deal with seems eerily similar to sh** that we deal with in our world. If you have not seen the show, I highly recommend that you watch all three seasons and come back to this review. It's on Prime Video, so go watch it. Okay? Good. Now I'm going to talk about the new season, and to do that, I have to get into spoilers. So here is your one and only spoiler warning. So yeah, it's really no surprise that Season 3 is pretty good. Season 2 ended with a lot of potential, such as Huey going to work for the lady who was secretly a soup with the ability to pop heads, or Homelander being on the edge of snapping and killing everyone. Just like the previous seasons, everything from the writing to the acting is pretty good here. With the previous season's antagonist being a literal Nazi from the era of Nazi Germany, it's hard to prop up another antagonist that the audience can see as worse than a Nazi. But this show does just that, and honestly, I think it's brilliant. Homelander is one of the greatest villains of all time, in my opinion, and I think the writers did a great job at convincing the audience that a man such as Homelander is infinitely more evil than an actual Nazi. When Stormfront talks up the white genocide narrative to his son, he's clearly tuning out and does not care what she has to say. The only genocide he cares about is the one happening to his public image. And in this season, when Stormfront talks about how their children would be the perfect master race, he's once again not interested. He even remarks on how he is the master race. That was the line that sold me on Homelander being the ultimate bad, even though it's kind of clear from the beginning that he's the ultimate bad, but you get my point. A man with godlike powers who will stop at nothing to ensure his public image is polished and maintained and that his feet are kissed in worship is a horrific threat to not only a single population, but humanity as a whole. Homelander gets even more characterization in this season, and for the first time ever, we get to see Homelander be scared. From the get-go, the plot of this season is clear. 
find a way to kill Homelander. Immediately, the conversation moves to figuring out what killed the iconic hero Soldier Boy decades prior, and so the boys go to investigate. But plot twist, Soldier Boy is alive and has this new power where the sound of the Russian language triggers him so much he blows shit up. Oh, and he's radioactive, so he can just fry the compound V drug out of the veins of superheroes. Hmm, I wonder where the story is going to go now. Seeing Homelander stare at his reflection as he copes with the fact that for the first time ever, he's met his match and has a Bruce to show for it was great. And a twist of events that I actually did not see coming because I just never thought about it, Soldier Boy is actually Homelander's father. When it comes to Homelander's origin, I think the writing has leaned to make you feel a shred of sympathy for him because he was raised in a lab and essentially created just to be Homelander, deprived of any real childhood or family. He has no actual family and anyone who raised him just experimented on him. So when he gets a phone call from Soldier Boy where he learns, well, I'll just let Soldier Boy explain. Danielle Deneau, bush like a Pomeranian. What? I beat my meat into a cup. Yeah, it's uh, yeah. Homelander is greatly improved in this season, and when I say improved, I really just mean he's further built up and built on. I'll be honest, I thought this season would end with Homelander being at his most vulnerable after having his powers fried out of him by Soldier Boy, but that's not what happens. Honestly, I'm glad I was wrong, because I'm really looking forward to seeing how the next season progresses Homelander's character. Homelander is not the only one who gets more characterization in this season. You know, after rambling for so long about how nobody plans out character arcs in Star Wars, it's really nice to watch something where people have natural character progression. Butcher is still an asshole to people, and is confronted several times over his selfishness in his mission to take down Vought and kill Homelander. We get to witness him relive memories of his traumatic childhood, and for a moment we actually see him show empathy, pity, and sadness. Carl Urban is still doing a fantastic job in this role, and you can tell he's enjoying it. One character arc I wasn't expecting, but greatly enjoyed was the progression of Huey. Huey's progression felt very natural, and I really like how his conflict with Starlight was handled. Huey isn't the biggest guy, and has never really stood up for himself in life. He always gets pushed around for it. In this season, Huey and Butcher take temporary Compound V, which gives them superpowers for 24 hours. I really like how this show went by show, don't tell when it came to Huey's internal battle. Rather than have him talk about how much he loves having powers, we just get to see him stare at his veins as he thinks about how he has real strength for the first time in his life. This isn't a case of Huey just suddenly becoming self-obsessed or quickly becoming addicted to the drug. It's really just Huey being Huey, and I like how Starlight recognizes this. I thought the drugs had f***ed you up, Huey, but this is you. This is all you. Huey was lying from the moment he told Starlight he didn't care that she had powers and he didn't. He's always wanted to be able to defend himself, stand up for others, and protect Starlight. This isn't a new Huey. It's the same Huey we've been familiar with, but this time he has access to a drug that gives him temporary powers. And in the finale, Huey realizes that this is the moment where he can be the one to save Starlight, but he knows taking Temp V again will kill him, and he acts out of love for Starlight by empowering her and allowing her to save herself. This is what a character arc looks Looks like. Mother's Milk also gets his own character arc as he struggles with the fact that the man who killed his entire family is still alive and his comrades are actually trying to work with him to kill Homelander. He also has a constant conflict with his ex-wife's new husband and struggles with being there for his daughter as a father or going out and helping take down Homelander and Soldier Boy. In the end, he tells his daughter about their family, their legacy, and how he's carrying it on. And his daughter loves him for that. Frenchie and Kamiko also get character arcs in this season, but I'll be honest, Frenchie's just wasn't as compelling telling to me. I don't think it's a problem with the writing, I think it's actually my fault. There's just a lot going on this season, and Frenchie's character wasn't something I was totally into, and I don't think that's a really big deal. It's, again, it's my fault. Frenchie and Kamiko are inseparable, so they kind of share an arc, but hers is more about coming to terms with the fact that having powers isn't what robbed her of a normal upbringing in life. When she loses her powers, she makes the personal decision to take V again so she can rejoin the fight, and that's empowering because she made the decision to have powers again. Again. This season also gives room to explore how other characters have been growing and developing during this time, like A-Train and Black Noir. A-Train actually has a character arc in this season, and the ultimate payoff is not only nightmarish for him, but compelling to the viewer. Huey is right when he says that A-Train never actually apologized for turning Robin into mush, and it took almost losing someone close to himself for A-Train to realize how terrible of a person he's been, and he finally gives a sincere apology. By the end of the season, the actual family he has doesn't even want to see him anymore, and Homelander 
Bowser especially doesn't consider him family. So he's just kind of left sitting there to think about all the shitty things he's done in life that's gotten him in this position. And I gotta say, I really like how this show does not try to do what 13 Reasons Why did to Bryce Walker with The Deep. It is very clear that The Deep is irredeemable, and any character arc that he gets is never meant to make you like him more or forgive him for the awful shit he's done. The Deep is still pathetic. He hasn't changed at all, and he's now the series punching bag for it, and I think it works. I didn't think it was possible, but Black Noir gets characterization this season, and he doesn't even speak. Just like everybody else, his wishes and desires to be seen as he is are shot down because the status quo of his image being a silent ninja does better for company profits. And this show gets weird sometimes and continues to get weird in this season as we are introduced to Black Noir's imaginary talking cartoon critter friends. We got you through that erection in the seventh grade. That Hard Rock Cafe m -m -m massacre in Lagos. And by golly, we'll get you through this too. And just when I was thinking, you know, I actually like Black Noir now, Homelander rips his intestines out and f***ing kills him. The only character in Ark in this season I didn't like was Maeve. Apparently the actress couldn't leave Ireland while this was filming during COVID or something along those lines. So her involvement in the overall plot is minimized up until the finale. And her scenes are in small places with like one or two people. I actually thought she died when she saved everyone from Soldier Boy in the finale. But at the same time, I kind of thought it was lame. But then I just kind of rolled my eyes eyes when it's revealed she's actually alive and it was a fake out. Like, okay, she gets a happy ending and that's cool, but I don't know, I just kind of went along with her being dead for like five minutes until it's revealed that she survived and then I'm like, oh, well, I don't know how I feel about it now. This season also continues to deliver relevant political commentary and satire, which I want to discuss because apparently there are people out there who totally misunderstood what this show was trying to say. The official Twitter account for the show posted some screenshots of posts on the subreddit where people talk talked about how this show suddenly got woke or is now pushing an agenda. And I mean, have we been watching the same show? The boys didn't suddenly get woke this season. It's always been woke. The political satire is clearly inspired by modern day politics, and that was always the point. When the show covers how corporations capitalize on gay pride, it wasn't from the angle of companies that do this promote a gay agenda, and that's bad because Tucker Carlson told me so. It was showing how corporations have no actual regard for the marginalized populations they claim to support once a year, and how them profiting from gay pride further disenfranchises those communities. Eh, I'm sorry. Did it really take people three seasons to realize that Homelander is a bad guy? Because I thought it was pretty obvious. It could not be more obvious that Homelander is an analog for Donald Trump. It's not subtle at all. And it's also not my opinion. It's been confirmed by the showrunner. Most of the time, the political commentary and character inserts are so on the nose that I genuinely can't fathom how anybody saw it any other way. Before you say, oh, another woke SJW YouTuber, unsubscribed, hear me out. Victoria Newman is an obvious parody of Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez in that she presents herself as progressive in comparison to other people around her, but at the end of the day, she still works to maintain the status quo and is only really concerned with branding, supporting her image, campaigning, and fundraising. And I cannot get around the fact that anybody watched this season and thought, you know that guy Blue Hawk? He's pretty based and red-pilled. I like him. Uh, the first thing you learn about him is that he curb stomped a black man's head into mush for committing an unspecified crime. So when he's confronted about brutalizing black people, he's like, uh, it's actually racist to call somebody racist. Then delivers the cliche and uninspired, I'm not racist, I have black friend speech. Then he goes off the f***ing rails about black crime rates. And he never addresses how cycles of poverty create crime because, you know, he's a f idiot and you're not supposed to agree with the things that he says and he says it's not his fault he only kills black people i ask again how is this man based it's hard not to get political when talking about this show because the show is very political this show has very obvious anti-capitalist themes which is ironic because it's streaming on amazon prime it's like watching anti-capitalism on capitalism.com if you want to learn more about that conflict i highly recommend that you read works from mark fisher even though The Boys is showcasing the effects of late-stage capitalism and decay, it is still very liberalized and whitewashed. I mean, Mother's Milk has a poster of Huey Newton, and then right above it is a portrait of Barack Obama. I'm not making that up. And no, I don't feel like explaining to you guys how a Black Panther Party revolutionary and a status quo neoliberal Democrat are ideological opposites. And this season has just the right amount of humor. Like I said, The Deep is the series punching bag for comic relief because he's so f***ing pathetic. He's always gotten the shaft for being the guy who can talk to fish, 
fish, and now in this season, he f**ks them. Specifically an octopus, but that's not important. The cutaway gags are still enjoyable and continue to remind me of the world I actually live in. Like when some of the soups and even real world celebrities cameo to sing John Lennon's Imagine in the same cringy cadence that they all did in our world a while back. Soldier Boy being from a completely different generation is used for humor sparingly, and I thought it worked really well. I especially love the clip of the movie Soldier Boy starred in where he gets his own Rambo 3 moment. Afghanistan is ours. Wrong. It's free. And I'll stand by our Mujahideen brothers until the end. So, overall, I would say that this show does a very good job at growing the characters that we already know and the ones that we are just now meeting. It keeps raising the stakes and the tension, it delivers on the visuals and the brutality, and overall, it's just really fun to watch. So, 8 out of 10, it was pretty good. Uh, in case you're wondering, I'd give season 1 and 2 both an 8 as well. Now that I have praised the boys as much as I can, it's time to get critical again, because Thor Love and Thunder is not great. It's definitely not bad, but it's got quite a few problems. This part of the review is spoiler free, but I will put a warning up before I talk about spoilers. Just like Obi-Wan Kenobi, it feels like my own fault for getting myself too excited for this. Thor Ragnarok is one of my favorite MCU movies of all time, and I really thought Taika Waititi would deliver another banger with Love and Thunder. Sometimes he nails it, but by the end, I wasn't really that impressed. Is this movie enjoyable? Yes. Did I have a good time watching it? Most of the time, yes. Does it have its flaws? Yes. Are those flaws readily apparent and sometimes distracting? Yeah. But before I go negative, I want to talk about what I actually did like. First, this movie is really fun to watch because Taika Waititi is a weird-ass guy and so are his movies. It's full of color and spectacle, and it definitely delivers on the visuals. The action is pretty tight, and the directing and editing was A-OK -okay in my eyes. Chris Hemsworth is clearly having fun playing Thor, and even though they shared two films together, this is the first time I actually thought he had chemistry with Natalie Portman. I really don't think Jane Foster is a character at all in the first two Thor movies. She was such a non-character that she was just brushed away in the script for the third one as having dumped Thor off screen. And I really didn't think we'd ever see her again. But to my surprise, Natalie Portman is back as Jane Foster, the Mighty Thor, and I really liked her in this movie. Jane becomes Mighty Thor for the same reason she does in the comics, but in case you don't read the comics, I won't explain it to you here, just see the movie for yourself. I can recall Taika Waititi saying that this movie shows how funny Natalie Portman can be, but I don't really remember her being that funny or having any real knee slappers or anything. I'm not saying she's dry and unfunny, it's just that I only recall her making like one joke. Her story in this movie is very personal and emotional, so her being a joke machine wouldn't work anyways. This movie does a decent job at advancing Thor's character further, and although it didn't always land for me, the emotional and important beats are there, and maybe I'll appreciate them more when I rewatch the movie. This movie has a lot to say about faith and love and what it means to have it and lose it. You may or may not find the themes in this movie compelling, but I think it works for what it is. The Guardians of the Galaxy are fine? Yeah. They're, they're fine. Fine for like the less than five minutes of screen time they have. They're in the movie for about as long as I expected, so I'm not complaining. The Guardian sticking around in this movie for its entirety would have not only clogged up the screen and script, but would have also been more expensive for Disney, so they're used sparingly. I don't really have any thoughts on Valkyrie or Zeus or even Sif. I kind of forgot she was even in this movie. I'm not going to mention my thoughts on Korg yet, and you're going to find out why in a second, but I got to talk about one of the biggest new faces in this movie. Christian Bale as Gore the God Butcher. Unless you live under a rock, I'm sure you've seen a movie with Christian Bale in it. He's a phenomenal actor who takes his roles very seriously, and is also very selective with the ones that he takes. I think this is part of why I was so excited to see him in this movie, and also because I thought he looked cool. I'm not a comics nerd, so I didn't flip out when it was shown he wasn't comic accurate. I don't really care. But yeah, Christian Bale as Gore steals the scene when he's on screen. But the problem is, he's not really on screen all that much. So this is where I'm going to transition into things that I did not like in this movie and I'll pick back up with Gore the God Butcher. So yeah, needless to say, I was disappointed with Gore. Gore's mission and the actions he takes to get there are the driving force of the plot, and I think it's pretty dumb, but I can't get into that without getting into spoilers, so I'll wait on that. For now, I want to vent about how underwhelming Gore was to me. You can disagree, it's totally fine, but I want to make it clear, I think Christian Bale is amazing. He is easily the best part of the movie. Everyone, including myself, was hyping up Gore, and it didn't help that articles came out saying that test audiences are saying Gore is one of the best, if not the best, MCU villain to date. So, is Gore the God Butcher the best MCU villain ever? No. No, he's not. Does he have understandable and compelling motivations for being a villain? Yes, I get why he's a villain, but the part where he actually started being a villain was just 
underwhelming. See, when you have a villain with the name Gore the God Butcher, that implies that at the very least he'll do one thing. But would you believe it if I told you that Gore the God Butcher doesn't actually butcher any gods? Not on screen at least. After his villain origin, all you get is people talking about what he's doing. I, f me, I guess it's my fault I thought we'd see Gore the God Butcher butcher some gods on screen. My bad, won't do that again. I think the one problem with this movie and that most people agree on, or at least are talking about, is that it's trying way too hard to be funny. I'd argue it's trying harder than The Last Jedi. I think Thor Ragnarok is actually pretty funny, and when I rewatch it, most of the jokes still make me exhale sharply out of my nostrils. But I don't know, man. I don't think most of the jokes in this one were funny, so I'm not sure how I feel after I rewatch it. I don't know if many of you all know this, but Taika Waititi didn't write Thor Ragnarok. He just directed it. This is the first Thor movie he's both written and directed, and you can tell he wrote these jokes because he gives them to himself. Korg, who is voiced by Watiti, makes quips and jokes non fing stop. It's honestly annoying and disappointing because Korg is pretty funny in Ragnarok. I thought screaming goats were really funny in middle school, but I'm an adult, so after the first five seconds, it just got old. The movie is an hour and 58 minutes long, and I don't think it's paced very well. It could have benefited from being like 15 minutes longer or so, stretched throughout, to extend important beats that we were either rushed through or just skipped over entirely. But the main thing that made me leave scratching my head was the plot, and I can't talk about it without getting into spoilers, so if you want to avoid spoilers, skip to this timestamp now. You have officially been warned. Like I said before, Gore's mission is the driving force of the plot in this movie, but we don't find out what his mission is until like an hour in, which is more than halfway through. So Gore shows up to new Asgard and unleashes some CGI shadow monsters on the whole place because Lego sets, and Thor and Jane show up, and Gore tries to kill Thor, but he fails and retreats. Then he uses the shadow monsters to kidnap all the kids in New Asgard, and this is where the plot kicks off. So Thor and crew set off to find the kids, which Gore is counting on. By this point, I'm thinking, okay, so Gore kidnapped all the kids because he knew Thor would come after him, and sure, he's probably more powerful in the Shadow Realm place. Okay, whatever. And I'm assuming that Gore wants Thor to come to him so he can kill him because Thor is a god and Gore is the god butcher. I've said his name a dozen fucking times, you already know this by now. But that's actually not the entire reason he wants Thor to come to him. More than halfway into the movie, we learn that Gore is after a brand new MacGuffin called Eternity and exists at the literal center of the universe. Nobody has ever reached Eternity, but the first person that does will be granted any wish they desire. Sound familiar? Again, I'm not a comics nerd, so when I see Eternity, I'm not like, oh my god, it's the guy from the comics and he's comic accurate, holy sh I really don't care. To me, he's another beginning of time magical MacGuffin that is really convenient for the story, just like the Book of Ashanti and Multiverse of Madness. Now, this next thing is what bothers me the most, and maybe I'm wrong and it's not a plot hole, but I'm pretty sure it makes no f***ing sense. Okay, so when Thor and crew arrive in the Shadow Realm to face Gore, Jane realizes that it's a trap because Gore is only after Thor's axe, Stormbreaker. Stormbreaker is the key that Gore needs in order to reach eternity, and I don't understand how or why this is the plot. I I'm just confused. The key to reaching a place that has existed for all of eternity is a weapon that was created five to six years ago. How does that make any sense? We watched Thor make Stormbreaker in Infinity War, and it's not like Watiti forgot that happened because Heimdall's son tells the kids the story of the time Thor made Stormbreaker to kill Thanos. So when you combine this pretty big plot hole that I think is a plot hole, coupled with the bad pacing and the fact that Gore is being an off-screen god slayer who just kidnaps a bunch of kids and dilly dallies in the shadows until our heroes reach him, is the reason I think the plot is overall dumb. But again, just because I think the plot is dumb doesn't mean I think the movie is bad. Like I said, I did enjoy this movie and I had a good time, and I'll definitely see it again soon, but it could have been better. I've given it some thought and... No, sorry, Ragnarok is still better. If you liked Ragnarok, I think it's safe to see that you'll like this movie too, but I can't say if you'll like it better or less than Ragnarok. I like the movie, but definitely wish it had done things a little more different. So, I'm going to give Thor Love and Thunder a 6.5. 5 out of 10, I think? Yeah, that's fair. Thank you to Atlas VPN for sponsoring this video. As someone who is doing their graduate studies in cybersecurity, I believe the smartest thing you can do is be protected and safe when using the internet. The best way to do that is with the VPN, and thanks to this sponsor, you can get one for a very sweet deal. Right now, Atlas VPN is running a huge discount. You can get a three-year subscription for just $1.99 a month with a 30-day money-back guarantee, and this is a deal you won't want to miss. Atlas VPN has more than 6 million users worldwide and works to make internet access secure and limitless for everyone. 
everyone. Not only is Atlas VPN a perfect way to browse and use the internet securely, but it can also be used to unlock a library of entertainment previously kept out of your reach. When you purchase Atlas VPN, you can utilize it to change the geographic location from which you are browsing the internet, which allows you to watch shows on Netflix or other streaming sites that aren't available in your home country. Atlas VPN is also incredibly fast, so I don't experience any interference when I'm streaming a show or playing a game. So don't miss out on this amazing deal because time is running out. Use the link in the description below to get a three-year subscription for just $1.99 a month with a 30-day money-back guarantee. Thank you again to Atlas VPN for sponsoring this video.